All right. So, hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another community conversation. Uh, this is number seven for this semester. Uh, this is a partnership with the Siebel Center for Design at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, really happy to have a couple of special guests come and talk to us about the intersection of social impact and education and diversifying design today. Uh, but before we introduce our special guests, Cesare and Terrence, I will share my screen here and jump into a bit of, let me see if I can get this right, a uh, bit of overview. So let's do this. So the class that we have here is called DTX 210. Uh, it's an introduction to social design class. And this is an introduction to uh, junior designers at the university who are starting their careers and their journeys in design. Uh, today, what we're going to do in our community conversation is um, as follows, just three simple things, an overview of what this is, uh, the guest introductions, and then we've got a special fireside chat where we'll do some Q&A and learn about the lived experiences and some of the story uh, of Cesare and Terrence, our special guests. So uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Brandon Middleton. I'm one of the co-instructors of this class. Uh, these are kind of the three contexts that I show up in. Um, Brandon, the professional, I work at Amazon Web Services by day. Uh, Brandon, the family guy, I've got three children and a wife and a number of things to do uh, at my house when I'm not working. And then community Brandon in the third picture there. I try to connect with lots of uh, social impact organizations and community orgs in order to uh, further kind of the work of uh, diversifying and um, bringing equity to tech where I work and to also this higher ed space um, so yeah, really excited to uh, moderate the conversation today. Uh, my co-instructor, Bert, is not on yet, but this is a quick slide from him. Uh, he, he's into piano, he's into typeface design. Uh, he's been here at the university uh, co-instructing for uh, a little bit now. So that's Bert, he might pop in a little bit later. And then uh, just to bring it back to the focal point of the class and like this experiment where we're you know, inviting community members into these community conversations. The idea is that we would, in the class, provide an on-ramp to understanding what design thinking and human-centered design was all about from a, you know, philosophical type of lens, but we also wanted to bring in the work of real people, uh, tactical, practical advice, and to hear the stories of folks that have actually been there and done that in the community. So on this slide, you see a number of organizations that uh, we've either spoken to or will speak to uh, through the course of this 16 week semester. And uh, we're really, really excited to marry not only the book smarts and some of the theory, but also some of the practical and some of the tactical um, in this kind of virtual remote and distanced uh, type of learning environment. All right, so without uh, further ado, what I'll do, I'll start with uh, Cesare and then I'll go over to Terrence after that, but um, let me pass the popcorn over to a good friend of mine. Uh, I respect both of these gentlemen's work in the spaces of education. Uh, they're both businessmen as well. So um, I'll pass the popcorn uh, from California here where I'm sitting over to, to Cesare and you can give, uh, you know, take two, three, four minutes to tell the people who you are, where you are, what you're up to these days. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me, Mr. Middleton, younger Mr. Middleton. <laughs> uh, I've uh, known Brandon for a long time, so this is an honor to share space uh, virtually, albeit um, with all of you and uh, who are connected to our alma mater, ILL, to all the folks in the room. Uh, I am in Nashville. I'm about to say Nashville, Illinois. No, I'm not. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> I'm in Nash. Thank you for the INIs I see in the chat. Um, I'm in Nashville. I am the inaugural associate professor of equity and inclusion in education policy in the Department of Leadership Policy and Organizations uh, in the Peabody College of Education and Human Development at Vanderbilt University. I've been here for about eight months before I came here, I was on the faculty 
in Michigan State University, and I would always tell people, you know, I'm MSU paid, but I'm Illinois made, and so um, I'm always going to rep for the I, the L, and the L, wherever I am, uh, but I spent seven years in Sparty land, and that was a generative uh, time intellectually and professionally, and I mean, I, I'll just keep it short because I want to be able to engage with you and answer your questions and uh, do that. But I was a middle school and high school math teacher in Chicago um, for a little under a decade before I um, went to school at night, finished the PhD and started a career in higher education. And I think my commitment has always been to working with young people um, in as many capacities as I could as an undergrad. I was a mentor at um, Edison Middle School right down um, Green Street in Champaign. And the young men that I mentored, well, the, the boys that I mentored uh, at 10 and 11 years old, I'm still in their lives. And um, that was my first sort of foray in terms of the work of social impactor, um, trying to engage with folks is taking time away you know, from campus to like really be in community uh, with the people that, um, and the community that surrounded campus. So that sort of set me on a trajectory as a teacher. Um, I had lots of questions that I began to ask myself in my professional career in education as a K-12 teacher and administrator that led me to graduate school. And um, now my work centers on uh, issues of race and equity in education, broadly speaking. But much of that work has been in service to understanding the schooling conditions that facilitate high academic outcomes and social outcomes for Black boys in particular, um, and Black kids more generally. And so I spent a lot of my time doing talks like this, traveling the country when we could travel, though the world is opening up a bit more now. Um, I teach courses on urban education and social policy, critical race theory and education. Um, and so I do a lot of work with just training people who tend to be frontliners, whether they're youth workers or um, teacher candidates or actual teachers and administrators. I do a lot of work with what I would identify to be frontline folks who are on the ground in youth serving organizations, schools and otherwise, um, to help them think about their work um, in the most complex but important ways as they navigate how to deliver services uh, in ways that reduce harm. So uh, yeah, I'll just stop there and, and turn the mic over to my brother Terrence. Yeah, thank you, Cesare. And um, you know, for the community members and the students that are out there, you know, like we always do, if you have questions that you wanted to queue up into the chat, you know, I've got some prepared ones, but it's always more fun. If we uh, if we do this as a community, as you have questions about uh, their stories and their journey, so um, yeah, over to you, uh, Terrence. I'll pass the popcorn. Hope you're uh, hearing us and seeing us all right. But the floor Absolutely. is yours. Absolutely, peace, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in this space with you all and to be in community discussing uh, community impact and design and, and the, the the space of design. Um, I am really big on design, whether that be curriculum design or designing experiences uh, for educators. I'm actually speaking to you all from a school that I just got doing, doing a, uh, got done doing a full day training for 18 campuses, uh, culture specialists. And they did this here. So I'm still at that school and, and finishing that up. But uh, as for how I came into my work and how I matured in my space, uh, it began when I met these gentlemen. I met these gentlemen back at U of I uh, at the time, I was doing some mentoring um, in the community. I also was doing some work at the Black House, uh, the, the Bruce D. Nesbitt African American Cultural Center uh, on campus, running radio stations and throwing parties and really beginning to uh, engage with people on creating spaces that were affirming and healing for us as students. Uh, being a part of Project 500 and different, um, you know, different ways that we resisted while we were on campus uh, and show that we are fully human, that we're deserving of, of love and care and, and safe spaces for ourselves. And so that work uh, got me connected to working in the community with youth that were incarcerated and youth that were justice involved uh, and giving, you know, space for them and supporting them through programs at the Boys and Girls Club, working in, uh, in the Youth uh, Department of Corrections for a moment. And I got a call from a wonderful human being named Cesare Warren, 
And he was at a school on the South side and he was like, hey, I think they need you at this school. Um, and I had that conversation with him because, you know, I had a different path for myself, a different way that I saw myself. I knew I always was concerned with justice. I was concerned uh, with connection and making sure folks were affirmed. Um, and I thought that was what I did on the side and that I was going to be someone's lawyer uh, so that I could amass wealth and then redistribute that wealth. So everything about me was connected to community healing. But the mechanism that I thought I had to use was to become a lawyer so that I could amass wealth and do that. Uh, and what Cesare's call did was it connected to some core parts of who I am that I had put to the side and thought that those were just peripheral parts of who I am. And so getting that call, I ended up getting hired at that particular school on the South side. And that was my doorway into my practice as an educator. Um, and what I am so grateful for is that in my practice as an educator, I was able to learn how to bring my full self into the space. Uh, and, and in doing so, you know, I stumbled upon practices, restorative practices that were used in my space, uh, in my work as an educator on the South Side and, and West Sides and different parts across Chicago. Um, and, you know, I've done so much training and curriculum building and professional development for other educators that I recognized that it was time for me to leave the schoolhouse and take those skills into other spaces to do the work that Ches does of building the capacity of those that serve our youth and serve our communities so that they can create spaces that are, are safe for all humans. Uh, and so in 2019, I shifted. I had been a school administrator for about 13 to 15 years. And in 2019, I started working for myself. Uh, we started working full-time for Project Restore Initiative, which is a healing justice company. If you have questions about what do I mean by healing justice, uh, healing justice has two sides. The first side is creating safe spaces for folks uh, to heal from the harm that they've experienced through structural violence or structural harm, uh, whether that is building curriculum, building safe spaces for women and women identifying folks, uh, reading clubs for men, whatever that can look like, racial healing circles. And then the other side of healing justice is building the capacity of those that leverage power to mitigate the risk of additional harm. So how do I help you learn uh, differently, learn different tools, frameworks, and skills so that you can leverage your power to create spaces that are safe. And when I say safe, I don't mean the absence of the possibility of harm, but the presence of the priority that if harm is done, restoration and reconciliation are first thing that we're going to do. Uh, and, and so that's what the work we do at Project Restore. And that's opened up opportunities for me to continue to do uh, impact work with uh, those that are youth workers, as, as Chad spoke about, Dr. Warren spoke about, or those that are, you know, traditional educators. It's also opened up space for me to do work as it relates to racial healing. I am the co-director of the TRHT Youth Institute, and TRHT stands for Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. It is a racial healing, a healing circle framework that was developed by Dr. Gail Christopher. And at the Youth Institute, we train youth in the community uh, to conduct and co-facilitate racial healing circles in their communities. They can be peer-to-peer -peer racial healing circles. They can be, uh, you know, transgenerational or you know, in the racial healing circles where they're doing it with older folks and, and just creating safe space for us to heal from how we've engaged with harm in all of the institutions that we interface with, not just the schoolhouse in our communities. When we think about disinvestment uh, and some of the things that we experience here in Chicago, uh, it's, it's been brilliant being able to be someone that's supporting our youth and being able to self-determine and self-actualize. And so that's the work that I do. Um, and, and that is uh, one of my uh, joys. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, thank you, Terrence, for kind of introducing the work that you do. And um, what I want to do is uh, basically kind of take it back. So you all both weren't always doing what you're currently doing. And uh, in the class that we've got, we've talked about a number of um, social things that impact our society and our communities and our neighborhoods one of them being kind of the lack of education. So we know that worldwide, there's 72 million children that are not enrolled in school. And you all both have talked a little bit about how education is such a transformative part of where we've got to go as a society. So I'll ask both of you, I'll start with uh, Dr. Warren to go back into your childhood, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year old Cesare, like, did you know, um, one, that you were headed this way from a very early age, and then two, just uh, paint a picture for what your community was like. Um, you know, you're from Chicago, and then Terrence, I'll let you talk about 
uh, East St. Louis, but like, just take us back to the origin story. Uh, what was little, little Cesare uh, thinking about and doing back in the day? Uh, little Cesare is not that different from Big Brother <laughs> Cesare, actually. I always wanted to be a teacher. What I didn't know, um, obviously, until probably graduate school is I would conflate and think and automatically associate schooling with education. And those are two different processes, especially if you think about that in the U.S., social con you know context um well p perhaps any any a global context that there's just different thing one denotes a sort of um organization and process uh that is really most presently marked by um philosophies that insist that certain people certain bodies occupy particular social classes and that um certain people are worthy of access to particular types of knowledge and others are not. Um, and it has a long history in, in sort of maintaining the social order. Schooling has a long history in maintaining the social order um, in, the, in the US and perhaps again, anywhere. Education is a much broader, um, I think I, I would describe education as a much broader process of enlightenment. But to, for your quest, to answer your question, I knew I wanted to be a teacher and so I knew I've always liked learning. I've never really liked school. And I think part of what that suggests to me is that I've always wanted education. I've always wanted to expand myself. And I was, I've always been enthralled with knowledge exchange and understanding and discourse. Even when I didn't have the language for that as a young person, I knew that I wanted to be doing something with my life that involved helping other people know things and seeing what that could do for them, you know, in terms of uh, self-efficacy or making them feel good about themselves or putting them on a path to pursue whatever it is that they feel like they want to pursue or just the, the enlightenment. I've always loved that part of things. I think part of even our connection, you know, as knowing each other for so long, knowledge exchange and conversation and being challenged intellectually has always been something I think that's been hallmarked to our relationships with one another. Um, and so going and teaching though, I realized as much as I loved learning, I also loved teaching, but I did not like being a teacher because so much of the project of teaching was constrained by all of this stuff that really didn't matter at the end of the day to the well being of the young people that were sitting in front of me and their families. And so I, I think, and part of, I was getting clues, you know, the memes and stuff that was going around with the red flags, you know, people were like saying things to me in, in high school and college around, you're too smart to be a teacher, you know, teaching, uh, you should go do something else. And I'm like, well, being a teacher, don't you need to be smart to be a teacher? Like, why are these things in competition or opposition? from teachers were saying this to me. And I just didn't understand that. But I think part of what they were saying is teaching is one thing, doing the work of educating a young person is one thing. This whole school and the politics of it all and the bureaucracy of it all and the competing interests and agendas by people who really at the end of the day don't care about Johnny or Sally who's sitting in front of you. We have to contend with all of that too. So. Part of now what my career is, um, where I situate myself is, I get to spend a lot of time trying to understand that the, all of these interlocking sort of systems um, and the political economy in a way that will help me strategize hey, and build an evidence base that is useful for uh, practitioners, right? So I, yeah, I, I think I've been on this journey for a really long time. But what happens on any journey, as you learn and you grow, you necessarily evolve to accommodate and be responsive to the context that you're in, even as those contexts are also shifting. Um, and so I've just seen my life sort of change and revolve in response. And I've just also just been really blessed to have interacted with some important people who said things and planted seeds that um, without those seeds, I don't know that I would actually be in this particular space um, that I'm sitting in. So I hope I answered that. Yeah, you did. You spoke uh, a little bit about mentorship and sponsorship and uh, role modeling, which we'll get to in a little bit. But um, 
before I pose the same question uh, to Terrence about kind of take us back to the neighborhood and young Terrence and what was in your mind. Um, I would love for people who are in the audience to maybe shout out a social impact organization or a neighborhood group that was influential or meant something to you. It could be the Boys, Boys and Girls Club. It could be uh, YMCA. It could be United, you know, any, any org just to uh, put it in the chat and like let, let our special guests scroll through. Uh, any organization that was impactful and meaningful for you and your development. And then Terrence, I'll come to you with that same question. Um, what was it like in East St. Louis? Uh, you know, we, we know what Chicago was like a little bit based on Cesare's response and, you know, some of uh, what we've spoken about being University of Illinois, but uh, take us, take us to your neighborhood, take us, uh, you know, a couple of decades back. So my context, uh, is 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 an interesting context, but you know it's essentially something we've heard before, right? A, a young person who looks around at their reality and they say, "I want to do what's ever necessary to make sure that certain things don't remain a consistent theme in my life, particularly poverty." Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I grew up. Um, my mother was was you know she got pregnant when she was in high school. Um, she got pregnant with me when she she had me when she was sixteen years old. She actually was displaced because she got pregnant with by me. You know, her, her parent at the time told her that she either needed to uh, to terminate the pregnancy or to get out of the house. And so my mom chose to be, uh, you know, to be housing insecure in order to, in order for me to be here. And so for that to be my space, right? That like my mom is living with her her boyfriend's mother, uh, and that's where I call home. Um, that's that's what I started. I started in a space of community. But what I realized in my family structure is that there had been a disconnection with academics and education as a as a inroads towards constructs of success, mm -hmm. uh, and that many of the men in my family were naturally entrepreneurial, um, but the opportunities connected to the entrepreneurship were limited, and so it would manifest in ways that may not necessarily have been kosher. Uh, as it relates to laws. And so I grew up having this weight on me of like, hey, I want to be able to take care of my family. I want to be able to uh, situate ourselves and our lived experience differently. And I thought I had, I had ingested the myth that money would fix the issues. And so I was attracted to spaces that could provide me money. So I had teachers that were like, you are brilliant in math and science, you should be a doctor. And I looked at doctors and I'm like, oh, they make okay money, but they also deal with blood and fluids and you know, all those things. And then I remember opening up a magazine and uh, it was this whole spread about this lawyer. This lawyer was this black lawyer. Uh, I wanna say it was Willie Gray was the name of the lawyer. Uh, but this black lawyer was so rich that he, uh, from his jet, he would call his bathtub and his bathtub would run the water to be prepared and keep it at temperature when he got to the bathtub. Now, mind you, this is mid nineties. This sounds like sci-fi when I'm reading this in this magazine. So I was like, okay, that's where it is. So I, I found out about Willie Gray. And then uh, I found out about Billy Medina. Um, and you know, for any of you that have ever seen the Fresh Prince, when you watch the Fresh Prince all the way through at the very end, you'll see one name, Quincy Jones. And then under that name, you'll see, you know, Benny Medina and who this person is. He is a lawyer uh, who represented Quincy Jones, Will Smith, Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, all these folks. And so I was like, OK, I love art. I love justice. I love making sure my people have what they need. This is where I'm going, right? I'm going to take the Perry Mason route. I'm going to become a lawyer. And I had so many folks that affirmed that my ability to communicate clearly, my ability to, to navigate the written word uh, were, were things that would be great, you know, skills for me to be in law. Um, what I didn't realize until like, you know, a couple years of therapy in my adulthood is that I essentially had created a vision of my future that was tethered to the context of my past. I was in a space where I saw my value and my ability to be able to change the economic space for my family. So if you ask what was 10 year old Terrence trying to do, 10 year old Terrence was trying to be a lawyer and an entrepreneur. I was, I was trying to amass enough money and I remember writing it down like, okay, I'm gonna work for a law firm for five years and I'm gonna take the money from that law firm and I'm gonna open up my own entertainment law space and the money that I get from signing the next Will Smith to do some, uh, you know, some famous movie, I'll then redetermine and redistribute those funds towards building business and access in my community. That was always my plan. Um, 
what I later realized is some of the things that just came to me naturally. Uh, education and teaching was always a part of my practice. Uh, and, I, and I started that really because uh, my mom was teaching in the church. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, and by the time I was 13, I was teaching all the youth in, in Sunday school. Uh, you know, I was a youth minister at the time. So teaching and engaging and having mentors in the community uh, that were teachers, that, that was natural to me. And I didn't realize it was a gifting um, and, and until I got to college. And whenever we were having some training, whether it was with the radio station, shout out to WBML and, uh, and the Black House, or whether it was with, uh, you know, my fraternity, folks were always looking at me to, you know, teach something or train something. And I just thought that was how I was wired. Um, I didn't realize that there was space in that world for me because I was really conditioned to believe that liberation for my family was just a monetary equation. That the more money I had, if I had enough money, if I had enough wealth, then I can move Will from Philly and, and put him in Beverly Hills and everything will be okay. Um, and I've grown to recognize that that's a limited understanding of even my possibility. Uh, and that yes, while resources are needed to shift things, even more than resources, policies, practices, ways of being, culture needs to be developed. So there, so you know, when we see folks that have those resources and they still are confronted with racialized oppression or they're confronted with policies that dehumanize, then that's a clear understanding that this isn't just about amassing wealth. Um, but that is something that's often taught to impoverished children, that education is about a means of uh, escaping poverty, not education is a means of self-actualizing. And I think one of the reasons why we don't see that juxtaposition, why we don't see it framed that way, is because if I understand that schooling is poor, is not what we want, right? We don't want to, you know, as, Chess, as Dr. Chess, as Warren talked about, we don't want people to be schooled where they're just accepting the status quo. We want them to be enlightened and educated and build tools to where they can self-determine and self-actualize. And those expressions of our humanity are not easy to control. And they sometimes create resistance for those in power. So I never was taught that education was the way by which I built the tools to self-actualize and self-determine. I was taught education is how I get my parents and get, get my family out of poverty. Yeah, that's super powerful. And uh, I'm just coming off of watching the third of three parts of that Kanye West genius documentary. And you see like uh, his mother being like somebody who helped him to build the self-confidence to buck up against all of the systems, whether it be education, whether it be kind of the traditional kind of media and entertainment industry, whether it be kind of fashion and people telling him to stay in one lane or not go into another. Uh, it's been interesting to like observe and see that play out in the lives of, you know, many, many people that come from uh, similar backgrounds in our community. So um, thank you for that. I, I want to come over to Chez and ask, uh, it seems like both of y'all have started like in the classroom or in the school and tried to affect change at a very like local level and then uh, had some epiphanies about how to scale that and how to uh, sword fight with a, a, a broader and a larger system. So I want to ask the question about just like systems and how you've changed strategy over time in order to um, make the maximum amount of impact. As designers, right, we want to get our ideas, our products, our processes out to as many people as possible while taking all the considerations from our target uh, audience and our target customers. But how have you kind of shifted your thinking about how to make the most impact uh, from, you know, when you were studying in undergrad all the way through, you know, your, your PhD and into kind of where you are in life now? Um. I think initially my commitment was, you know, just one black child teaching math at a time. And I really enjoyed that work. But again, I realized, you know, this is very complicated. Um, most immediately it was complicated because I was working with a lot of white women who were really well intentioned, but who really struggled to see themselves. Um, and I didn't have a language or an understanding of how to communicate with them about it. Or, I, and I didn't really have a language to be able to tell people, I'm having success with my, you know, group of eighth graders, however many, you know, 120 students or whatever. 
because I'm making time to know them, but I didn't know how to articulate that to somebody else so that they could replicate it. So going to graduate school in part was so that I could develop a language so I could help other people to do the direct work. But I think as I've continued to develop and as I understand the world with clearer eyes, um, part of the conversation and the strategy is helping people to understand that while they didn't build the systems that they're operating in, they're either going to disrupt them or be complicit and helping them to actually draw the connections between their social location and the system that existed before them, but how it is that they may be helping to sustain the system and undermine their good intentions and the work that they're doing has been an important part of, um, I think, uh, for me, moving the work forward. And again, that just comes in some ways in terms of my own readiness to have those conversations with one, um, being able to use myself as a starting place for how I know I was complicit in the ways that I've tried to unlearn um, particular behaviors and then offering that up as um, text from which to have these conversations with people. I think, too, it is learning as the technology develops how to leverage that, that technology and information passes across our screens and in and out of our hands and our heads so quickly now than it did when we were in school <laughs> that um, I've had to learn how to leverage even that, you know, how to take a Twitter hashtag and use it as a text to have these conversations with people depending on my audience. Now, if I'm taking this and I'm talking to, let's say, leaders of an organization, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out what is their mission and what is, what is bringing them to the work that they're doing. I wanna understand the language that they're using to justify why and how they're engaging the ways that they are. And my job as an academic, this is the privilege that I have because I have a context and a content knowledge is to examine that language and then help them to see the gaps in their logic. And then to use that as a bridge to say, now let me offer you some ways to do the work differently not with the expectation that they that they would or should um, take what I'm saying at face value and just implement. My, my conversation with people is, is, you know your context and your organization better than I could ever know it. My goal is for me to understand what's happening here from a data standpoint and from an experiential knowledge standpoint and marry what's happening with my content knowledge. And then together, let me offer you some alternatives and some pathways. But the ways that this plays itself out is completely up to you. And hopefully inspire in them a sort of humility in the work that they're willing to start over, try again. And I think the last thing I'll say is that I um, try my best to uh, demystify and disorient people's um, preconceived notions of what an academic is and what they're supposed to bring to the table uh, and try to really give people um, a humanity and a, a person, uh, be personable enough with them that they feel safe having the conversation with me. There are a lot of people who would identify themselves as like justice scholars who are so intense and so hardcore that their audiences, that their audiences are distracted by how they're performing. And they have legitimately important things to say. But I think about this because um, I don't want to temper my blackness or my whatever in to be in the space. But I am thinking about if I have a particular goal, what is going to be a distraction to that goal? And can I position myself to limit the distractions so that they can hear the message that I have to deliver to them? Because I know that the message can really move them forward. So I'm always I'm thinking about the intellectual and the emotional and the, the person, the interpersonal. Um, those all play a big role in my work. Yeah, that's beautiful. We we've, you know, through seven weeks so far, talked about um, empathy. Uh, about introspection and like asking uh, ourselves about kind of our own context before we go out and try to seek the context and the background uh, of someone else. 
So as designers, I think a lot of what uh, you said is very relevant and very important because we're always designing um, with a system in mind. There's something that's happened before we got there. That's something going to happen after we leave. And um, as, as nice it as it would be to start from scratch, uh, we have to pick up most of the times where an organization or where a person or where a neighborhood or where a community is and, and take it forward. So um, Terrence, I want to ask you that same question because you probably have a different answer in terms of how you've uh, sword fight, you know, you know, carried out the sword fight between individual classroom and larger systemic change. Like I'd love for you to share like how your thinking also has um, morphed over time as you've gotten older and uh, tried, tried out different ventures and different ways to bring impact to, you know, the audience that you care about. You might be on mute, let's see. You're muted, bro. It happens, man. You know, in this virtual space, if I had $15 for every time I've spoken muted, I would probably be about $1,500 stronger. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's two phases that I can speak to and answer that question. Um, you know, when I first came into education and, and even into mentoring, a lot of the ways that I expressed myself was based in my own conditioning. Because one of the things that we do in spaces, particularly in when it connects to any institution, but particularly with education, is that we have what's called like this winner's projection, right? Where because we won in this system, we think that the way to win is to do what we did, right? It's, it's, the, it's the, you went over your cousin's house and you see him win the video game. So he's like, hey, how you do that? Teach me how, right? And we think that's how it works in oppressive institutions. So as an educator, initially I was, I was doing all of the things that I speak against now. I was doing the, you better than this, you know what I mean? Think of, you need to be better, like making it about the individual and their capacity uh, and their willingness to want to be successful and not calling into question the institution in the context that make an impact on an individual. And so when I recognized that that was not working, um, I, did, I had to do some remembering. Uh, and you know, in, our, in my work, I often say that healing is remembering. Uh, it's not just remembering who we are, remembering our humanity, remembering the stories uh, that, that have blessed us and made us who we are, but it's also bringing ourselves back into membership together as a collective family. And a lot of the spaces that are harmful and the reason why we need social impact is that we allow our institutions to kind of forget our dignity and our humanity and cause us to be in these spaces of competition and isolation. Um, and I think when we talk about design, we so often think about uh, the competitive analysis in, uh, in systems that are capitalistic, right? So like if I'm designing a computer, I want my computer to do certain things. But if someone else has designed a computer, then I have to develop speciality to make sure my computer is better, right? That, that someone must be supreme relationship. And I think, unfortunately, we bring that into our spaces of education and we silo ourselves in the design process because we want to figure out the new thing that's never been done, rather than remembering that other people were in this space working in fugitivity before us. So what I had to start doing is start figuring out who is doing this differently? What does that look like? And what are their successes? Um, not so I can just say, hey, this is mine, but so that I can test it out because that's the power of play is that when we're designing, you know, whether I'm designing a uh, interface or I'm designing a educational experience, I have to have the end user in mind and I have to have space for them to interact and play with whatever that thing is to build connection, build efficacy, et cetera. And so when I started doing that search, I started learning about circle practices. I started learning about restorative justice, We're learning about restorative practices, learning that many educators before me, uh, whether you're talking about the freedom schools that were happening um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were doing this way of schooling that centered the humanity of youth and their communities, uh, learning about the Black Panthers and ways that they, they taught in their spaces and, the, and the, the programs that they designed for their youth. And so my second phase of being an educator was that space of, all right, I gotta do this in fugitivity because I'm, you know, I'm in schools during the, the, the height of the zero tolerance space. And so I'm pushing with my principals like, hey, I know you want me to suspend these kids, but I got this idea for this program that I wanna do called Project Restore. So my company is actually named after the first 
program I did in a school that was in a space of fugitivity. We, I was at a school that had one of those zero tolerance policies where if kids got a certain number of detentions, they needed to be suspended. So what I went to my principals and said, okay, instead of a suspension, can they do hours in my after school program? And in that after school program, I gave them space to connect. I gave them space to talk about their lived experiences, to write, to play, to talk about what they may have gotten in trouble for, or the difficulty that or puzzle that they may have been presented with that put them in that predicament. But really it gave that space that Dr. Warren talked about for me to get to know those youth. And when I realized that that was working, then you couldn't tell me nothing. Now it's like, all right, I tested this out. I played, played with this, I'm good with this. And then I took that position from being one that, hey, I'm testing things out to where I would then have people from other campuses that were like, hey, can you come to our campus and train us on how to do what you're doing? Um, and so I took that skill with me, that, that ability to investigate and to figure out what works for our youth and the center of their experience. Um, and after playing, then I had to confront. I think that third phase probably was me confronting, uh, you know, some of the racialized, oppressive ways that I was engaging with youth, right? Uh, you know, these constructs of perfectionism or constructs of zero tolerance or, you know, you know, saying things to kids like, you keep that outside stuff outside, but in here you're a student, right? Disconnecting them from who they, their full authentic self. And when in that confrontation is where I kind of got where I am now and, and I'm continuing to grow, where this is about managing spaces that are safe for humans. Um, and, and when I got to that period of my life, that opened up all sorts of doors of ways that I could support empowering or, or supporting the empowering of youth to self-determine and self-actualize and also support and empowering other youth workers and practitioners of well-being to create safe spaces for themselves, the youth and the communities they serve. And that's beautiful. And you pulled so many different things that we've gone through in terms of being designers. Uh, you talked about prototyping ideas, like while you were there, uh, trying things out, you know, it wasn't perfect, but you iterated on it, you got feedback, you, um, you know, went to the next V2, V3, V4 of it before it was like launched and out the door and ready to go. So um, yeah, for all the, you know, design folks out there, um, and even the community members who need to know that you got to start somewhere that doesn't have to be perfect. Um, that's a great kind of example to put in the back pocket there. So, and I'm sure I, you I, all, have, I'm sure you all have talked about that validated learning, right. And, and, you know, creating that, uh, the MVP, right. That, that minimal viable product and getting it out there so that you can test it out and getting it with your end user. So for me, the end user was youth. So mm -hmm. I would try it out and then I would get feedback from the youth. Is this valuable time for you? Are you getting something out of this? So, um, definitely for our, our design folks, it, it still works. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did see a couple questions come in uh, into the chat. So I'm gonna uh, invite Taylon if you wanted to come off mute for yours and then we'll come to, uh, to Tyler's questions. I saw that in the chat. So uh, first Taylon, go ahead and then we'll go to Tyler after that. Uh, first, I wanna say thank you both for being here. Um, I, this is really like inspiring for me as being somebody that is looking to mentor youth in the community, especially young black men. Um, and I have a question in the chat, which I'm gonna get to in a second, but you said something that really like sparked something. How did you go about creating that open space for the youth to kind of like talk about what they were going through to really like get that off their chest and kind of grow in that space? How'd you go about that? I'll start uh, Chiz and you jump in. Um, I first had to confront the ego that was connected to hierarchy. When we're in spaces, particularly when youth, like we like that we're the older, that we're in charge. Like we think back to our experiences and, and seeing the teacher be in charge and like, we wanna be in charge, right? Um, and so I think sometimes we don't think about how that is that position of hierarchy is not a space for you to exhibit harm, but a, but a, but a, a responsibility for you to leverage that power to create safe space. And so I had I had to confront that, that a lot of times I I was I was creating this hierarchical relationship with the youth to establish that I'm the grown up, I'm the expert, I'm the one you should follow. 
And instead, what I started to lean into is I started to lean into connecting with the youth through their lived experience so that they began to see me as a human just as they are human um, and creating, you know, practices, whether it was circle practices, check ins, whether it was giving them opportunities to talk about the things that they were concerned with is really establishing relationship that was not connected explicitly to a hierarchy but establishing a relationship that was connected to who they are as full human beings. And so I think that was what the start was. And that comes with trepidation because all of us are skeptical of systems that have in the past been harmful to us. And so, you know, some youth was like, I don't really know. Is Pruitt really like that? I'm scared of Pruitt. I don't want to. But then other youth was like, no, nah, Mr. Pruitt is cool. We talk about this, that, and the third. It's not of me being friends with the youth, right? It's not losing my sense of self or, or bringing them into spaces that are harmful me for me to bring them in, but it's making sure that their humanity is valued and that I'm expressing to them that I'm a human being as well. I mean, some of us, we grew up in schools where we're not even sure how our teachers went to the restroom, right? They, they just were like these figures that will be in the classroom and we never connected with them for real on a human level. So creating those spaces to where they would see my sons or we would talk about things they were interested in or they'd get my opinion or I asked them their opinions, building rapport, um, when you build rapport, if you if you anyone in here is interested in engaging with youth, uh, I, I advise you to pick up a resource by Zaretta Hammond uh, called "Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain." And in that book, she talks about how we build relationships. That building relationships involves creating a sense of trust, and that trust is built through care. And the reason why those things are important is not because they're niceties, it's because our brains are wired towards belonging, right? If we feel a sense of belonging in a space, right, is a reason why, you know, Mr. Middleton, he creates this space where we can feel this sense of belonging, that releases oxytocin in our brains and provides us what we need to learn, think, and be creative. But if I'm in spaces where the hierarchy or the policies or the practices, they make me feel unsafe, then what, I, what my brain does is it releases cortisol and it releases that cortisol and my brain does an amygdala hijack and that's how you get fight, flight, freeze or appease. And I can't be creative in that state. And so in order for me to create a space where we can learn together, we can learn new ways of being, my work has to be to build strong relationships so that there's a sense of belonging and building rapport is a part of that. And you build that rapport through affirmation, affirming the humanity of those that you're engaging with, affirming your humanity as well, and you build that rapport through validation. That is where you're utilizing the empathy that Mr. Middleton talked about of saying, hey, I recognize young person that you have a lived experience that I am not an expert in. Tell me more. And how can I leverage my power to confront those obstacles that are being placed in front of you? Validation and affirmation that builds rapport and that strengthens those relationships so people feel safe to open up. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's extremely powerful. Thank you for that. Um, the other question I had is, what advice would you give someone wanting to mentor young Black men to kind of help them get on the path of wherever they're at to, to trying to get where they're trying to go and become as successful in that field? Yeah, um, I think uh, all of what Terrence just said is a good thing that... Um, I've always thought about mentoring, even as an 18 year old mentoring, you know, sixth graders. Um, I have always thought of it as a, a process of reciprocity where um, there are things that I know, but I'm really genuinely interested in what's occupying your mind. And so more often than not, I wanted to spend a disproportionate amount of our time just listening to them talk about whatever was valuable to them. And learning to ask, actually ask young people permission to offer them perspective. Because um, part of what that does is that it demonstrates to them, one, that their voice holds power, that their experiences are valuable, but also that <clears throat> they are bringing to the mentoring relationship a level of authority and agency that they have permission to exercise use of. Part of what I've learned in my career is um, <clears throat> young people, uh, I'm thinking about the black kids that I've worked with. Um, they're gonna be those kids who um, assert themselves 
uh, against and in opposition to your authority without your permission. And then there are going to be those young people who a lot, uh, and we tend to call those the problem kids, right? Uh, and we don't read their behavior and their resistance as productive because it's telling us something about how they're reading the relationship and their courage to resist the authority figure. That's actually, I, I theorized and talked about this as um, they have a vision of possibility for their own lives that we can't comprehend. And so they're so committed to that vision that they're willing to resist you and the institution you represent to get to that vision. We become roadblocks. And so I'm one, I'm learning how part of the work is not being a roadblock, but two, there are lots of young people who will not disrespect you, but they won't, they won't actually show up and be present either. Their, their bodies are there, but they're not there. And it's in part because they have not yet been given permission. And this is, I think that this, this um, feels intuitive, but it's not always intuitive just to say, uh, you get to be what you want or you get to imagine the world however you want to imagine the world and I'm not going to judge it. My, my role here is simply to be a sounding board and then to reciprocate that and say, you know, I'm thinking about this thing that I'm, I'm wrestling with. I want to accomplish this thing. I don't know. What's your, I mean, what you think about it? And they might look at you and be like, I don't know anything about it. I'm 10. But the, for the fact that you're asking them and inviting them into a space where they get to have a perspective on your life and you get to have a perspective on, your, on their lives, I think similar to Terrence, I talk to educators about how we flatten hierarchies in the relationships that we build with young people such that they feel like they just have much more power and autonomy. And a lot of what that means is you are, one framing is I'm resigning power but I would reframe that to say, I'm just repositioning and redirecting the power. Um, I'm sharing it, I'm distributing it such that everybody feels like they have some ownership in the space, uh, whether that's a classroom or just me and you at a table once a week talking through whatever. Um, so I think that that's, it. and the, the other thing that I'll say, the last two things, particularly where it relates to black men with black boys, I think we have to, um, be attentive to the intersections of race and gender and sexuality and that we allow all versions of a young person to emerge without judgment, but that we also continue to develop ourselves and having conversations that don't just center on what it means to be black, but that truly we start to develop some understandings about what does it mean to be black and a boy and to be whatever, however young person is identifying as a way to get them to think about the various systems of power that they're gonna to have to navigate, but not trying to project onto them how they need to navigate them. We all need to be free. And I think there's a particular responsibility that black men have with black boys, not to, and to be really conscious about not reproducing um, forms of, of gender, um, gender relations that are oppressive. Because if a young person is questioning or queer, or trying to figure themselves out, and you say something unsavory, that's a version of themselves that they've automatically flattened in the relationship. And we should just be very sensitive to that as we're um, building with young people. So that was another thing, but I, I'll stop there. And I think in connection to, to that, uh, Chez, is like remembering that, particularly if you are a Black male that wants to mentor Black men, that you experience the conditioning. And so when people ask me like, hey, you know, what do you say to someone that wants to mentor a black man? I ask them to explore their why. Like, like why do you want to mentor a black man? Do you want to mentor a black man because you have a savior's complex and you want to save them from a context? Or do you want to mentor a black man because you want to support them in being able to self-determine and self-actualize and to build the world that they want to build for themselves? So explore that why. And then and while exploring that why, you also have, also have to explore what was the harmful ways that you may have been conditioned as a, as a black man that could cause harm for others, where I can project, project identities, I can project constructs. I've been a part of spaces where there's mentors and you know there, there are things that the mentors are saying to young folks that I'm like, nah, fam, you can't say that to him. Like that's, that's, that's harmful. Like we're reproducing that harm. And so 
in order to get ourselves in that space where we are creating safe space for folks to self-actualize and create safe space where people feel safe to be fully who and thoughts authentically who they are, then I got to get in the practice of exploring my stuff and making sure that I'm not bringing my stuff and centering it in our relationship. And I'm not bleeding on you. Yeah, I can't be bleeding on you and call that mentorship. I need to really be centered on how can I support this young person and building the world for themselves that they deserve. That's really should be at the center of if you want to do that. Um, and I don't know if you're going to go to this next question, Brandon, um, but I definitely like Tyler's questions and I, I got some answers for that adult learner thing whenever you're ready. Yeah, Tyler, I, I wanted to invite you to come off mute. Like some of what has been spoken in the previous question might be a little bit of an answer uh, to the ones that you put out there, but like frame it again if you have any uh, specific details to put on it and then we'll uh, have a dialogue about it. Thanks, Brandon. I agree. I wasn't going to ask uh, that first question. Um, I actually went ahead and bought that book, Terrence, for my friend, because that's why I asked the question about apathy. Um, but yes, I definitely wanted to get to the instructional design question. I work with adult learners, um, but I'm just like wondering what your ID process is and how you're baking in like the healing and the inclusion, because um, this is something that I'm trying to do more in my day to day. Uh, you know, whenever, whenever you're designing something, uh, we are, you know, design essentially is based in the context, right? There's a context that this design is confronting. So whether it was, you know, and, and I, I'm only saying this not because I believe this to be scientific or historic, but I just saw, what was it, like a, a commercial of, uh, I think it was a movie. I think it was, uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the movie, sorry to bother you. Right. I just watched oh, Sorry to Bother yeah. You. Yeah, Lakeith Stanfield, yeah. yeah. That's one of my favorite <laughs> movies. So in the part of Sorry to Bother You, and they were talking about, you know, tools have been used by cavemen and someone hit somebody in the head with a brick and then they put a stick on a brick and made it a hammer. So like that construct of I designed this for the context, um, mm -hmm. that, that is something we need to remember. So if I'm building an educational space, then I have to explore the context. And I, I not only have to explore the context as it is, but I have to explore the limitations connected to the context. And I think one of the key leg limitations when you're talking about, you know, reskilling and tech and, and upskilling to be engaged is recognizing that in many of those spaces, particularly in tech, black and brown identities have not been present. So since yeah. black and brown identities have yeah. not been present, yeah. there is a tool a lived experience, an area of expertise that all of your folks you're reskilling already have. They know what it is to be in spaces as a black and brown person, right? Mm -hmm. So that opens them up to, an, to another set of possibilities as to how they can utilize these new tools and these new skills. It also opens them up as being able to contribute a different set of understandings and lived experiences to someone else that might wanna hire them in these skills, yeah. right? Like, you know, Brandon working for, X, for, for company X, he doesn't just come with his tech skills. He comes with the other areas of expertise that he has and that lived experience ultimately supports someone's strategic plan. So I think yeah. one thing that you have to, in those spaces, especially adult learning spaces, is you have to rehumanize the space in, as them being experts in their lived experience and showing the value of, of that as an asset. Uh, there is mm -hmm. a, a writer by the last name of Yoso, Y-O-S-S-O, uh, who did an article on community cultural wealth. This way that we look at ourselves to know that how we exist right, how we communicate, our styling, how we move, those are all a part of the package of who Terrence is. And I bring that into my design, I bring that into the utilization of my skills and getting folks to start playing with ways that who I am can connect to what I know how to do. And that's where you start finding genius happening, right? I'm thinking of apps that didn't exist five years ago that are really just who I am connected to what I do. And, and now we're all a part of it or we're all a part of, of that expression of design. So I think that's one thing to do is recenter their the power and the value of their expertise as humans and their lived experience in their design work. Um, and I also think it's a space for them to challenge Right, that, that you know, mm. if, if we've not been available in these spaces, that means these spaces have missed out on us. 
Um, so right. since they've missed out on us, what can I bring to these particular spaces that can not only push forward their strategic planning, but they can also create inroads for there to be more folks like me involved and invested? Yeah. yeah. And does that, that hit your answer? Yeah, definitely. Um, just to make sure I understand, you are speaking in terms of like transferable skills, yes. kind of, right? Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. All my, yes, it, absolutely. All the, the, the thing, when you think about upskilling, particularly in tech, is tech is really the design is about problem solving, right? Whether the problem mm -hmm. is yeah. what coffee will I drink or whether the problem is, you know, how will I get my car to not use fuel, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at people that have been uh, engaging with systems of oppression their whole lives. Mm -hmm. You're looking at problem solvers. Yeah. <laughs> how do we show them that you have this skill set? Yeah. How do we realign the skills that you have into a different space? Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank um, you. And we, we've touched on uh, data, we've touched on storytelling a bit in kind of previous classes. And I think as a backdrop to, to Arvin's question, I'm going to uh, invite you to come off mute in a sec. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, the younger generation be forced over the last couple of years to do education differently, to do it over remote and distance technology. So maybe to start to bring some of those thoughts back to our remembrance as a community that we've talked through over the, the last couple of weeks. Um, with that as a backdrop, Arvin, I want you to come off mute and, uh, and ask your question and add any details if you like. Yep. So uh, kind of as Brandon said, as we've transitioned to this like remote online learning environment and all of the indicators are saying that that's something we'll continue to rely on. Um, how do you maintain that same level of engagement among students? Um, these typically like I've seen in some like the courses that I've taught um, to younger kids revolving coding in my community. It's really easy for kids to just, you know, put themselves on mute and not engage themselves at all. So how do you um, um, as you were as you both were talking about earlier, um, providing your permission and really engaging with these kids, how do you maintain that in um, an online early uh, learning environment? Yeah, maybe we'll start with, uh, with Chaz and then Terrence, if you want to put something on it as well, we'll go in that order. Uh, I don't have like, a, a, I think a very sophisticated answer. I think what I've foregrounded in my own teaching online and, and working with teachers and other folks who are having similar challenges is I think human connection shows up as um, it's always been important, but it has become especially pronounced in a, a, a virtual world, um, pun intended. So um, I think in whatever ways that I can prioritize the human connection, that's what I wanna do. And how do we build human connection online? I think part of it is, yes, we show up for a particular course that has a particular set of aims and objectives, but I wanna start with a question of the day. I'm gonna play music. I'm gonna find something out about each person on my screen, something specific about them um, that they have to put in the chat. And then I'm gonna ask questions about the things that they're talking about. So who's your favorite superhero? Oh, you like Superman. Let's talk about Superman for the first few minutes of the class and get in and build that habit. Oh, I heard you say this. That has nothing to do with the content, but I wanna talk about that in, even in the middle of this moment. Cause I think again, people wanna be seen even if they don't wanna be seen. <laughs> uh, and so if there are ways to really make that an integral part of your remote learning experience, I think you get a, a major benefit from that. One strategy that I know that um, I've learned from a, a teacher is they do something called family business. And they did this when they were in person, but they would do it in the online environment. And they would similarly say, what's the family business? And people could, the students could talk about whatever they want to talk about. Cameras on, cameras off. But what she found was she would keep a spreadsheet and she would write down some of the different things that different people were saying. And then she would make it her business for kids who didn't speak, let's say three or four days in a row to actually follow up and specifically ask them about something social that had nothing to do with the course and be engaging them on the thing that they're talking about because it brings them and it, it makes them feel close and connected to you. Um, so those are things that sort of stand out to me. Uh, and obviously, 
creating as much engagement amongst the participants. Like doing a whole lot of talking at people obviously is just not it, in person or online, but that's really bad if it's online. <laughs> so as small groups and all of that type of stuff is really important. Yeah. That, I think it starts to answer the question, Arvin. Let's um, pass the popcorn yeah. to parents too to see if you've got uh, any any thoughts and feedback and experiences. Absolutely, uh, we we actually had to confront this um, in in being uh, co-director for the TRC Youth Institute. Uh, when 2020 hit, we were preparing to do our summer program to train. You know, I remember us sitting our logic model, and we were together. We're gonna have 500 youths, and we're gonna have them in the school, and we're gonna learn how to do racial healing, and then we're gonna do racial healing circles across the city, and then COVID happened. And we had to turn this model that was an in-person model into a virtual model and shift our curriculum from being in-person to virtual. So what we had to do is we had to um, begin to like really investigate what are the metrics that we're using for engagement and do the metrics of engagement in person actually even matter now, right? Uh, what I think sometimes happens in virtual spaces and I understand why it happens because like, you know, we still play The Sims and we still play like, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto and these games. We want our virtual spaces to be replicas of our lived experiences. But the thing that virtual spaces sometimes provide us is the opportunity to deal in science fiction, right? I've, I've never met King Cooper. Uh, you know, I mean, I've never, you know, jumped down a pipe that took me to another layer, but, you know, there is a way that we can create space that's far different than what we may have experienced in person. So Chaz was right on with it, using certain social emotional cues uh, and, and social emotional competencies, making sure that music is playing when someone's coming in to make sure that they're welcome, making sure that we spend time first connecting to their humanity. We might do grounding exercises. We might do collective breathing. And, and maybe, maybe engagement doesn't mean I have to have my camera on. So when we were having youth, we were teaching our first summer, we had a hundred youth that we were training uh, and they would have, you know, it was part of their summer work through one summer in Chicago. They had a job with us to learn to be racial healing practitioners. And, and they were in their cohorts learning. And we made it a rule that like, hey, we don't have to have the camera on. We want you to show up fully. And showing up fully today may mean cameras on, you smiling, you engaging, but if your hair not done, you don't want this camera on, right? Or if you're watching your brothers and sisters while you're in this class, you might be muted, not because you don't want to engage, because your little nephew will keep screaming. So like, we have to realize that we are human beings engaged in a context, and we have to give space for that context and reiterate our norms. Like, we would love to see your face, but if there are conditions that disallow you from doing that, we just are happy that you're here and engaging in those practices to make sure that there are spaces to connect, that there are spaces for breakout rooms, our spaces for, um, you know, for folks to contribute. Even now, when you think about, you know, what we're modeling right now, that, you know, we're responding to questions with you, but we're engaging with you. What you'll find is that there's some people that have the capacity and the space to engage, and there are others that may not. And if that, if that is what is happening today on Thursday, March 3rd, that may not be what's happening tomorrow. Um, and if we're the facilitators, then our work is about creating the conditions and curating the conditions where learning can happen and where people can be affirmed. So that might mean we follow up, right? Chaz has his camera off. I know normally he's, he's really into the conversation. I might pull up on Chaz in the email and be like, hey, I know you in session, is everything all good? Because it's, our context may not be that I was disengaged. The context may be that I had something going on and so I had to split my attention. Um, and then there's the other thing that designers don't like to hear, but I just gotta say it. If your shit's boring, it's boring, right? <laughs> like like if, if you create a space that is like, I don't really wanna be in this space, then the, the best person to tell you that is your end user and them saying, hey, uh, this could be better. So what are our feed, how do we do feedback, right? One of the things that we did in our, in our institute is that we instituted, instead of having uh, the summative assessment that we have at the beginning and the end of our programming, we did formative assessments. And then we communicated to our students that, hey, if we, we do this survey every week, not because we wanna give you busy work, it's because we want to shift our practice if it is not fitting your needs. 
And when we started doing that, youth would tell us, hey, can we cut the videos into like four minute chunks instead of 30 minute videos? Those be long as hell, right? And so then we cut it into 30 minute chunks and making not only the adjustments that they tell you to make, but communicating with them, hey, this is what we're gonna continue based on your feedback. This is what we're gonna improve based on your feedback. And this is what's new based on your feedback. And that builds that buy-in from your end user to where they're constantly telling you how to make your spaces more engaged. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, uh, I think since we talked about the tech industry a lot, like the arrogance of the person who's designing something to not incorporate the feedback of the very people that they're designing it for is the ultimate waste of time on both sides. So like, I think uh, those words, if you, if you don't get too much more, you know, out of the last couple of minutes that we have, please put that one in your back pocket. Um, I wanted to pivot over to maybe our last question to reflect on for the day before we uh, get out of here. I'm gonna pose this to you, Chaz, and then come over Terrence with the same question about just futurism. So like what you would hope to see in the future uh, in terms of where we are today, um, inside of the space of education and higher education, where we are uh, as a neighborhood and as a community. And then, um, yeah, just a summary of any, any other thoughts that you might've had uh, for the students and for the community as we take it out. Uh, so Chaz, I'll pass the popcorn over to you and then uh, futurism coming at you, Terrence, with the same question. Oh man, uh, I don't know that. <laughs> Um, futurism, I mean, I dream of the time where we, um, where everybody can just show up as their full selves and there not be a consequence for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if I can participate in training researchers are doing the research studying and documenting the work of people who are doing that well and to then theorize and build from that empirical base a vision um out of my own imagination in relationship to what i know in the past and the present um then that's the work that i want to do and i think there's lots of opportunity because i've heard more there, there are more people asking questions about futures than uh, I think in a broader, uh, more general sense. I'm, turning, I'm sure there have always been people asking about futures. It probably has had a lot to do with capitalist gain. But I think that there are people who are asking and imagining and positioning themselves to be future oriented who truly have a heart and an intention towards improving the wellness and well-being of us all. And um, those are, that's the, I wanna be in conversation with those people and I um, wanna be a, a conductor, if you will. Um, uh, and I think part of my own gifting, I think has been connecting people. Um, I love the work of connecting people. So I think for me, Futures is, uh, a really connected world, but not one that's intrusive and like, uh, you know, like social media and stuff can be overwhelming because people feel too connected, but connected in the right way so that we can build a sort of political solidarity we need to get to the versions of the world that we desire and deserve. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Um, same question over to you, Terrence. Um, and then after, I'm gonna prepare all of the community and the students out there. It's, it's gonna be selfie time after that. So get ready if you wanna come off, we'll do our uh, our class community selfie at the end and then start to get, get y'all out of here. So uh, for now, passing the popcorn over to you, Terrence. Uh, one thing that uh, the chair said that I think is like resonating with me right now is the construct of being uh, too connected. And, um, what it what would resonate with me is that it's superficially connected. It's kind of it, it's it's you know you are I'm, video games is a space for me. Uh, you remember when video game controllers have cords, right? And you'd have that one cousin that wanted to play with you, and you know you thought, well, yeah, you could play with me, and you would give them a controller that wasn't plugged up. 
Uh, I feel like that's what a lot of the connection is. It's a superficial connection. Like, I think I'm plugged in, but I'm not really plugged into your humanity. So I think for me, when I think about that dream, uh, my dream is to be in a space where I don't have to remind people that they're human beings. Like that is my ultimate dream where my work can shift from rehumanizing spaces and policies and practices and, and recentering dignity to a space where I can only focus on continual maintenance, healing and, and uh, possibility. Like when, when, my, when my work comes like, hey, I'm consulting people on how to continue their healing journeys and, and to embrace their own possibilities rather than standing in solidarity with people to confront policies, practices and ways of being that dehumanize. I feel like I made it right. Like, like that is the, the ultimate dream because I feel that that dream is an expression of my ancestors. Um, that dream is an expression of all those that have uh, done the work of creating this space for me to be in this moment is having that space where they could just be, where they can, you know, be who they fully are um, and express and dream towards an end that they design for themselves. Uh, and I think, you know, that comes when we no longer have to remind people and institutions and systems that they're dealing with humans. Mm. Wow. Well, uh, we've been left with a lot to think about uh, the class and the community. Um, we could probably go on for another hour and a half or two hours uh, on lots of questions that we didn't get to ask. But for now, uh, I just wanted to fast forward and say uh, thank you to, to Dr. Warren, to Terrence for their time. Uh, I'm going to stop my share. And like I promised, we're going to come off. Uh, we're gonna shout out to all the Middletons in the room. <laughs> well, the family came by today. My yes, Lord. Yes, we love you. <laughs> so, uh, um, working on my tax documents, Mother Middleton. <laughs> yeah. So, let's do uh, the selfie that we always do. I'm going to count this thing down in five, and four, and three, and two. And then one, here we go. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, we've got another community conversation in the books. Uh, what I'm gonna do is play a little bit of a commercial. Uh, Dr. Warren is an author, and then Terrence has something that he just did at the Surge Institute. It's about five minutes of video, but I want you all to see a little bit of uh, uh, the work that I didn't get to show and showcase. So. If you need to drop, feel free, uh, but we're going to watch a little bit of a video here and that'll take us out. So here we go. Centering possibility. My name is Dr. Cesare Warren. I am an associate professor of urban education and teacher education at Michigan State University, founder and CEO of Identity Educational Solutions, LLC, and I am the author of Centering Possibility in Black Education. I was inspired to write this book um, in 2019 as I spent some time in Harlem in New York City in residence as part of an academic fellowship there. And I read a book called Freedom Dreams. And the book is written by Robin D.G. Kelly. And in that book, he chronicles what was in the minds of activists, intellectuals, entertainers who would identify themselves as part of the Black radical tradition. Centering Possibility in Black Education is a book that is for young people, for elders, for caregivers, for advocates, and for educators alike, all people who are interested in improving the education condition of Black children. Uh, it is a book that is written in the tradition of Black education uh, as a field, a field that has been committed to both documenting all of the ways that schooling in the U.S. has been uh, an exercise in the dehumanization of Black children and Black people, but also how we have struggled against that dehumanization, how we have uh, uh, fought and persisted to realize versions and forms of schooling that are indeed enriching and inviting for Black children and Black educators. And so this book picks up there, which sort of brings me to my second point, which is, that possibility determines the stretch of our doing and being in, in the world as Black people, not our problems. And as we think about the significance of anti-Blackness as incredibly compelling for helping us to understand uh, the ways that schools are sites of, of pain and suffering for Black people, 
it is more compelling to consider what we could do when we lead with possibility rather than leading with our problems. And so I, I see I see that as incredibly important. And I think also that Blackness is full of possibility, that we recast and re-understand Blackness as not a thing to be escaped or disdained, but that it is a thing full of wonder and opportunity that enjoy and healing. And so uh, this book and this work is an, an invitation to turn into Blackness for joy and, and to, to reimagine nighttime as not something to be escaped while we wait for a morning to come for joy, but to really turn into the nighttime as its own uh, project of joy. I wrote this book both during the pandemic, but also through a racial uprising as we came to understand the loss of George Floyd and his last words, I can't breathe, and Breonna Taylor and all the folks who have lost their lives at the hands of police. We know what not being able to breathe is about in this book, I wrote it with every image and every poem, uh, every drawing and every story to be a breath of fresh air. Inhale, exhale as you read this book. I think it is a book that is gonna encourage and motivate us to freedom dream. It's the substance of my freedom dream and the teacher in me, my greatest desire is that whoever picks it up, that it will also inspire their freedom dream. All right. So that's uh one we've got. I definitely will be buying. Please. Uh the commercial, I, I figure we have to put it in the end, but uh didn't want the work to not be seen uh, in our in our segment today. So Peace, good my people. Name my name is Terrence Pruitt. I am uh, honored, one, to be the leader of Project Restore Initiative, a company that does healing justice work here in the Chicagoland area and across the country. And I'm also honored to be inviting you to let us write our story 2022. This is a surge sponsored event that is sure to galvanize black male educators and those that are in solidarity with black males in education in the work of creating the conditions we deserve. How can we, one, self-determine, write the story and create the spaces that allow black males to thrive as students and as educators? But two, how do we right the wrongs? How do we begin to build our capacity to shift our practice so that we don't create more harm in the space of education? Come on out. Let's talk about these concepts. There'll be tons of presentations by brilliant black men and black males, youth and adults alike. So if you are a black male educator, you know a black male educator, or you are in solidarity with the success of black males, if you are interested in spaces and educational spaces being created that allow black males to thrive, do me the favor. Come on out on February 21st, 2022, from nine to noon Pacific or 12 to three Eastern, wherever you are on the map, click the register link and come on out. Again, February 21st from nine to noon Pacific, 12 to three Eastern. I want to see you. It's uh, my birthday. So the best you can do for me as a birthday gift is to register and bring yourself and others out. If you know anyone that cares about black males and the conditions surrounding us as educators and in education, send them that link, click that link, and we welcome to see you there. Peace, y'all. Right, and that's it, y'all. Um, throw your snaps and your claps in there for uh, Dr. Warren and Terrence. Uh, we want to thank everybody for their time today. Um, I'm going to go off of the recording here in a second, but uh, Bert, I see you jumped in there. Any last things to leave us with my co-instructors here uh, before we jump out? Uh, no, I don't have anything, but uh, thank you so much uh, to both of you for, for being here and for just showering wisdom on us. Well, uh, our thoughts and prayers stay with um, the folks in Eastern Europe that are going through what they're going through. Uh, we encourage you all to, uh, what do we say always, drink water, uh, take care of yourself, your families, your communities, uh, mind your business, stay warm, and uh, we will see all of y'all next Thursday afternoon. So thank you again, Chaz, and thank you again, Terrence.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.